Hello, Soundies. Welcome to our Sound for Video session. I have two two guests here today. We're going to bring them right in. Hello, Matt. Hello, Jude. How are you? Today? Hey, hey, Curtis. How you doing? Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> Unmute my own mic here. <laughs> um, we, I think, most many of you that are here on the stream know our two friends here. So, Matt, you want to do a quick intro, and then we'll go over to Jude for an intro. Uh, Matt Ruff from. Music City USA, as we call it here in Nashville, and five decades running mainly church music, but other events. So, Thank you so much for joining us. And then Jude, over to you. Hey, my name is Jude. Uh, I'm in Oklahoma City, and I have been in pro audio now uh, about 26 years, 27 years. Started out as a country radio DJ and then transitioned into live sound. I've done a little bit of work in studio, uh, but now we just focus on... Um, uh, big installs. Uh, we focus on troubleshooting. And then uh, this church right here, Southwest Baptist Church, I've sat in this position for 23 years. And it's really the honor of my life to be able to do sound here. Uh, we had a great church service this morning, and uh, we'll have another one tonight as well. Fantastic. Thanks so much for joining us today. Really, really appreciate it. So one topic that, uh, that actually Matt suggested, and that I think is a super important topic for all of us doing sound of any sort, whether it's for front of house, house of worship, uh, location sound, anything, is choosing the right mic in the right situation. So with that, um, that's a big topic. There's a lot to cover. But what I was hoping we could do is let's start. Um, Jude, do you want to give us a little, a little quick um, maybe introduction on how you approach that? What, what, what's your high level plan for that? And what are the different types of things that you generally have to mic? Okay. Uh, so first of all, um, I want to talk about the, the sound system and the sound system. Um, Curtis, can you hear me okay? I adjusted. Okay, we're good. Okay. Uh, so your sound system is here to help you communicate or help you with an extension of communication. So it's been said, if you're further than six feet away, you lose that personal connection, that personal one-on-one -on -one conversation communication. So in pro audio and in, in live PA or sound reinforcement, public address, it's my job or the sound operator's job to be able to take that conversation and put it in front of everybody's face. So it doesn't matter how big or small the venue is, you still have that personal connection with who's speaking. So in uh, this church, I'm about 80, 85 feet away from the pulpit. So um, a, a good a good bit away from from the preaching from the singing and then there's another four rows that sit behind me and so it's my job to be able to try to put that sound right in front of you and give you that personal one-on-one -on -one connection so when when we look at sound uh, we also want to talk about what are we trying to do um, here at, at our church uh, it's not a it's not a church where you walk in and you're gonna get a big production a big show there's churches here in Oklahoma City that will pump a hundred percent oxygen into the room to make you feel good. So when you leave church, you have this um, this oxygen high. Uh, we don't have disco balls. We don't have fog machines. Uh, we're more about the content. So the content is what's going to drive everything. Uh, we would be considered a traditional church service. Uh, our primary instruments are pianos, organ, and then the voice. Now, we do quite a bit of other instruments throughout the year, but those are our go-to daily drivers uh, every service. And so with that being said, there's not a lot to hide behind. Um, when, when you clutter up the mix with, with just noise, you don't have to be as precise. You don't have to be uh, worried about the, the intonation or the intelligibility as much when you're just pumping out a bunch of volume. Anybody can make it loud, but where, where you... Uh, try to make it to where people can understand it and there's a full rich immersive sound that's what i'm going for um several years ago uh, my wife and i went to the broadway musical wicked uh, so we got to see it in oklahoma city we went to, down to the bass theater in austin texas and i was always so disappointed by the sound in those performing arts because we listened to it in our house on our stereo system and it was just incredible. But then when we'd go to the live venue, it was always so disappointing. And so me, to me, it was like, why do we, why do we waste our money? Um, a year ago, a year and a half ago, we were in New York doing some uh, installs. And so Monica and I got to see Broadway, uh, Wicked on Broadway. And that was the first time ever that I left uh, the facility thinking, wow, that was amazing. So I try to do the same thing here at this church. I don't, 
Uh, well, not just this church, but wherever I run sound. I don't want people thinking, ah, that sounded good, but I'd rather listen to it in my car or I'd rather listen to it uh, on my home theater system. Uh, we have a unique ability here at the church where we can move a lot of air with our sound system. And that's basically what sound is doing. It's it's leaving the output transducer or the speaker and it's bumping into all these molecules. And so with a bigger auditorium, we have some pretty big speakers, woofers, horns. And so we can move a lot of air and make it really immersive and so that's what I try to do is I want it to be when you, when you sit here, it's like, wow, uh, that was, that was to me. That was, he was singing to me. He was preaching to me. Uh, that person just had a, a great tone and it just felt like they were right in front of me. So that's what drives, uh, my microphone decisions. Um, uh, I'm always just not, not, not discouraged, but I'm, I'm always shocked at how many microphones, Curtis, that you talk about that I have no idea what they are. I have never used an Earthworks microphone. Um, there's a, a Sheps. I've never used Sheps. I have no idea what it, a Sheps even looks like. Uh, so most of the mics that I use, they're going to be Audio-Technica. They're going to be Sure. They're going to be Lecture Voice. And so that's what I wanted to show you today is just a couple of the mics I use and why. Are we ready to dive into this? Before we do that, um, okay. we are getting a uh, note here that when I talk, we're hearing me echo back on from your side, it sounds like, maybe. Um, just something to keep in mind. We might have to ride faders here, but There's a um, button. I think... There's echo. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. And then let's actually, let's come back to that in just a moment here, yeah. Jude. Let's, yeah. uh, Matt, let's have you kind of talk about what's your philosophy here as far as uh, choosing microphones. Um, it's, it's, it's like any other profession. You try to choose the right tool for what you're trying to do. You know, if you're trying to use, if you're, if you're working on a metric car and you're trying to use imperial tools, it can be a huge challenge. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I like certain brands of mics because they've, I've seen how good they are. One of the things we talked about pre-show was that there are some cheap mics that can be excellent the trouble is they're not consistent you know when i pick up an F sm57 which is the mic i mean i've used so many over the years they all are within this very tight tolerance of each other and if they're not they get sent to some place else that sells them for a lot less and they get they don't get the sure name on them so when it comes to to doing yes as sound guys we we just want to represent what they're hearing so that everybody in the room now part of that is the sound system if your sound system isn't big enough or capable enough there's no no cure for the sound guy and or the mic can can cure that problem and i was i've been in a setup like that where i was brought in to run sound and they literally it was for a ballroom they literally had one of those little PA systems in a box, you know, you clamshells or you open it up and that was all they had. This wasn't going to work. Don't blame the sound guy. It's just, it, it's not, if it's not there, it's not going to work. It's kind of like taking a Yugo up on a NASCAR track. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the, the challenge is picking the right mic for the right instrument. And then again, then the sound guy's job, which is a, is an art form getting that mix so that you hear not just drums say and i'll stop there no that's all good that's all good with that let's jump in jude let's uh let's have a tour yeah so matt nailed it he he talked about uh almost like that human touch where uh the the microphone is is such a small part of our sound system um uh, People will come in into our church and they'll want to say, hey, what, what EQ are you using on that mic to make that sound? Well, I tell them it's very subjective because that's based upon the acoustics of this room and then that's based upon the uh, speakers that we have. So we use Alltech Lansing Voice of the Theater, which they are a point source speaker designed in the 50s, 60s, 70s. That, I mean, that's that's the technology we're using still today. And so uh, it's it's so important to, to figure out how 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 to mic things properly so our our daily driver with our preaching mic is going to be uh this microphone right here it's the sure dl4 it's the duraplex which curtis i think you um you did a twinplex review 
years ago. And, and a Duraplex. Yep. And so I'm going to turn this on. Are you able to hear this okay? Okay, so uh, I'm running all of these mics just flat. There's there's no EQ on them. So uh, and then also I'm struggling with a cold right now, so I, I'm not going to sound the greatest. Uh, but this is the mic that we prefer to use. Uh, Curtis talks about the chin uh, shadow, and so we try to put the microphone right below the knot of the preacher because when the preacher's looking down, they're blowing a lot of air out of their mouth, especially with the plosive consonants B's, T's, P's, uh, C's, and when they're looking down at the pulpit reading their Bible. I want to make sure that we try to minimize that as much as we can. We're also using an omnidirectional microphone. You have omni or you have car cardioid. Cardioid is terrible for P-pops and plosives, but you get more gain before feedback. Over the years, I've rather, I'd rather deal with the feedback or work with that and then not have the distraction of, of those plosive consonants. And uh, a lot of people use a head-worn mic or an over-the-ear mic. This is our Countryman E6. Okay, so I am now off the uh, lapel. Uh, we will use the Countryman E6 for uh, ladies' conferences, ladies' meetings, because there, there's not uh, really anything good to clip uh, a lapel onto for a lady. A lot of times they're a lot more softer spoken to, um, but we um, primarily use the lapel. So it's the MX1, I'm sorry, MX150, that's our old element. It's the DL4. The uh, next microphone, this is the Shure uh, SM87A. So this is going to be in the same platform as the um, as the uh, the body pack that we had. It's the QLXD series. This is going to run about $1,000 right now, the way it is. Um, this is going to be uh, about uh, $950. Sorry, $950 plus another $300 for your lapel element. So that is... That's uh, what you're going to be looking at. It, it's a far cry from the, their Accent system, uh, but for us, the Shure QLXD, that has been uh, very, very good. The um, pulpit mic that we use, the podium mic, it's going to be the Shure MX418. So we kept everything, let me bring this up here, we kept everything in the same family uh, when it comes to the preaching mic, the wireless mics, and the pulpit mic, because I want this to sound the same. So when we transition from the preacher to the music director to announcements, uh, it's going to sound somewhat similar. Uh, the lapel mics pick up differently than a microphone on a stick or in the hand, but we're trying to minimize the acoustic differences between the two because we don't want it to be these radically totally different sounds when when people um, uh, get up there uh, in different parts of the service then we get into our main microphone for our uh, vocals this is going to be the uh, audio technica this is the artist elite 3300 so i'll just bring this up as well is that too loud for you Okay, so this mic, this is uh, going to be right about $300 right now, and this is what we use all of our vocal mics for. Uh, it's a corded mic. I stick with corded mics as much as I can because I want to try to minimize the dropouts or, or problems. Uh, within a wireless mic, there's so much happening in this barrel that can really wreak havoc on a service. So we're in Oklahoma City. It's a, it's a decent-sized market, and we have to deal with all the problems with wireless. So there's no on and off switch. There's no batteries. There's nothing that if, if you drop this, you're not, you don't have the electronics that, that are going to uh, send it through wirelessly. You're, you're not going to damage that. So these things are reliable. The worst thing that ever happens is a cord that gets messed up. And you're starting to see a trend in the industry where if you need reliability, you're not going wireless. You're going wired. Our mindset at the church is we're going to go wireless if that's the better option. If it's if it's better to go wireless or wired, we're going to go wired. So uh, we'll play a clip. Monica, can you uh, pull up the um, the Mac? And uh, I'll show you a, a little clip here of. Um, uh, let's see here. I'm sorry. Well. I guess, oh, there we go. Curtis and Matt were laughing at me earlier because I don't know how to run anything that has to do with video. So this is uh, a flute player at our church. You can see right there behind her is the black, brown, red, orange, yellow. We use the resistor color code on our microphones, on our 10 vocal mics. And she's using a wireless mic because we have found over the years that is a better way to, to mic the flutist. So you can see that uh, over the ear mic right down on her chin line. 
and that has worked out really well. We used to use a mic and just put it right over her head, but uh, we don't do that anymore. So here is how we mic our violins. Most of the time uh, when we mic violins, uh, we're going to go with a wired version, but there are some applications where we go wireless. So I just wanted to show you, and I know your wife, uh, Curtis, is uh, partial to this instrument, the violin and viola. Yep. Um, but that is how we mic them. Is I'll take that same, that's actually an MX-150, that's the old... No, I'm sure that is the DL4 element. And we just clip it right there on the strings, right where the strings tie into the body. And we get this really amazing sound. We um, we had to uh, leave the windscreen on because we started getting breath noises uh, from the, from the uh, artist or the instrumentalist. So we leave the windscreen on. Now, this next clip uh, is going to be just an example of, of uh, what happened in our church service with a violin. We'll have the Redeemed Trio come and sing a song entitled Never Walk Alone. Now this is live. So we're going to do a video on my um, YouTube channel explaining what happened on this. Right. I think Jude may need, to, may need to make one adjustment up there, but let's start that again, Brother Kevin. So that's when things go wrong, and that was probably the worst mistake I have ever made. And that's because we had a wireless mic on a violin. And so we'll, we'll dive into that down the road um, on another video. Uh -huh. And then uh, also, let me bring this down here. Uh, I won't waste all the time today, but I have another video. It's a year, a year old video where I just went through kind of a behind the scenes look at our Christmas program and uh, just showed the different mics that I use and how I use them. And we, we use our daily microphones for our Christmas programs, but then we beef it up as well and we um, try to add a lot more stuff. So Monica, if you'll come back to the main camera and I'll turn this down. So then when we get into our instrument mics, um, this is the Artist Elite 5100 from uh, Audio-Technica, and this is another $299 mic. This is what we use for our choirs. Uh, somebody last week asked uh, for a video or um, explanation on a um, guitar, and we got several people sick right now, and so I wasn't able to get any audio clips from the guitars, but we use two of these on a guitar. We'll mic them in stereo and get a pretty amazing sound. Um, we use the SM57. Uh, this is great for um, brass, um, anything that's loud, that's harsh. Uh, we find like on trombones, trumpets, uh, um, even saxophones, that's too bright of a sound on a condenser mic, so we'll go with a dynamic mic. Uh, these things are about $119. Um, we're going to break a Curtis Judd rule here. Uh, we use shotgun mics in our church. Uh, we use one of them in our baptistry because the baptistry uh, is pretty bad. It's uh, water and then it has rock behind it. It just sounds terrible. So we're trying to isolate the voice as much as we can. And then also we'll use this on flutes in our orchestra as well. We're able to, to, to zero in right on those flutes and we get an amazing sound off the flutes. Those are a couple hundred dollars a piece. Uh, we use Sennheiser and then we also use Audio-Technica. And I don't want to share this mic with you, but I'm going to. Uh, this is the Behringer C2, okay? Uh, I am not a Behringer fan by any means, but um, a gentleman that was just here, Joe Miser, he's the one that got me onto these uh, Behringer C2s. They're 50, 60 bucks for a matched set. And they're a very clean, quiet sound. So it's a condenser mic. It's a small format. We'll use these on clarinets. We'll use them uh, if we have to on uh, on uh, violins or violas if we mic them overhead. We have used them on some French horns. And so this condenser mic does not sound bad at all. And then finally, our other main microphone uh, on our pianos is going to be this uh, Crown. Actually, I think it's a static now. Um, PZM. So this is the 6D version. This is uh, the smaller version. We have this in one of our uh, classrooms, but we use the 30D, which is about twice as big. Uh, and we use uh, two microphones on our pianos. So the whole point is that I wanted to show you um, 
We don't have a huge selection of microphones. We don't have this massive inventory of microphones, but we are getting some pretty amazing sounds from the microphones. And it's not just solely focused on the microphone itself. Uh, we are looking at uh, tones. Uh, we're looking at EQs. We're looking at volumes. And then we also teach the people how to use a microphone as well. You can tell uh, who listens to what music based on how they work the microphone, how they hold the microphone, and so it's, it's very important that we get a good sound coming into the sound system. And uh, we'll give you a little clip here. So this is the last clip, Curtis. This is um, uh, just a 30 second clip from our uh, Christmas program uh, just this last December. And uh, this is gonna be kind of a behind the scenes look of what's going on. So Monica, go ahead and take the Mac. Is that loud enough for you, Curtis? All good. Okay. Now this is all live. Okay, uh, Monica, if you want to come back here to the main camera. So that's just a, a quick rundown of what we do, and it's just pretty amazing that we get to have a part in it. And I just want to say this. Uh, this has been 23 years of me just practicing, making a lot of mistakes, uh, failures, and then also trying, hey, this works, and if I tweak it this way, I get a better result. And so it's just never being satisfied with status quo or that's good enough uh, when I am uh, mixing, um, I treat it as a musical instrument, and I got hands on uh, the faders. So that Christmas program, we used 55 microphones. Uh, we had, uh, I think, 12 or 13 violins and violas, and all of those were hardwired with a uh, DL4 or an MX-150 lavalier element. And that gives us uh, ability to... I uh, kind of work with some of the instruments that uh, don't sound the best. We can kind of put them in the mix. And then also when you have uh, nearly 200 voices uh, right next to them, uh, it's real easy for those instrument mics to get lost and just cluttered with the choir sound. So we try to close mic as much as we can uh, where it's applicable and where it's going to enhance. Okay, we have about a million questions, and I think it's time. <laughs> Matt, I actually want to have you, uh, let's have you kind of ask some questions and talk it over with with uh, Jude here, let's talk about miking pianos. And why don't yeah. you first tell us how you approach it, and then let's talk about the other approach that, that Jude's using. I have always been on the quest to find the best miking setup for a piano, because in a church setup, not necessarily, but even in a, a or, big orchestra, luckily, I, when I was in Fort Worth at the time, we had the beginning of the Van Cliburn competition. If you know who Van Cliburn is, Google him, he was this famous uh, by, uh, piano player, won the Russian contest. Anyway, unbelievable piano player. And, and the competition still happens in Fort Worth every X number of years. And so I've gone through, you know, various mics. It wasn't until I found the uh, the uh, Earthworks, they have a, a piano mic that's basically a metal that fits on both ends of the man of the the piano inside you can go look on the website and there's just two mics to pick that up it's it's a very expensive mic it's three thousand dollars but it does an amazing job at capturing the piano um just equally so their choir mics are excellent and they're not they're expensive they're probably 700 bucks 
Um, and those we had to buy. And when, when I made the appeal to the deacons, I said, it's real simple. You buy them once and these mics will last you forever. So it's a long-term investment. Um, there are, uh, you know, AKG and the, you have the Behringer's, those pencil condenser mics. You can get those if you, if you know where to look, you can get them for about a hundred, $125. And those are great instrument mics for a lot of situations. But as I said before, I know a, a seasoned sound guy who can, who can mix better than I can. He can run an entire, he did, he ran an entire orchestra on SM 57s just to prove a point. Every, there was only one mic an SM 57. He had 60 of them for this orchestra performance and it sounded amazing. Now, it's not the ideal mic for certain places, but it's the best general purpose dynamic mic for an instrument there is, especially if you're using a stand-up piano and versus a, a, a grand piano. There's a hole generally at, at an upright piano. You put that 57 right there, and it's a pretty good sound. So um, the, way, the way I've never seen the way Jude does it done with, with those flat, those panel mics, I call them. Mm -hmm. But it sounded good, so that's that's the that's the only thing that matters. I, I've been in, as I said, we didn't talk about it. I think last time, I was in Africa running at this event, and they were running the sound system off car batteries. Okay, none of the mics had any kind of label on them at all. Okay, they were just something from China that somebody had donated to them, and it was there was only six mics because that's all the, the channels they had. We had to make it work, but it sounded not bad. It was open air, which is even worse. But again, you, you do what you can only do what you can do. And, but it's not having a mic. I mean, listen, it used to be done. They don't build buildings the way they used to. Okay. Now, Jude would have known this. Some of you will not, but there was a famous preacher in the 1600s called Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He was the biggest preacher in London. His 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 sanctuary set five thousand with another thousand standing, and he preached to that entire congregation because of good acoustics with no mics. Okay, the church that when I joined Nashville, it's like they didn't hire. In fact, they if they hired a an acoustic engineer. He, he came from, <laughs> he came, he was deaf. I mean, he, it was the worst acoustics I've ever heard in a church and they had to spend $400,000 just getting it decent, which is true so much in the buildings built today. So you have to do it with mics because you can't do it with, with what the acoustics are in the room. Now, if you go to the Smitterhorn, which is our concert hall here in, in Nashville that was built from the ground up that has a building inside of a building because of for acoustics okay the 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 blowers they put on the air conditioning system <laughs> are so powerful but they're in like a separate room and this tunnel that this wind has to take before it ever gets into the theater is like a racetrack it's a it's a, no no it's just gorgeous sound or carnegie hall in new york another example of something that was built for good acoustics so yeah. that's yeah. the acoustics of the room make our jobs. That's why church sounds a little bit easier. You, you're in the same facility every time. If you're in a, I mean, if you're in a basketball or, you know, if you're in these arenas, like here, you know, the big concerts are generally at Bridgestone arena. It's where the hockey team and the basketball team. And, you know, that's where it's a challenge. The one sure. thing I will say the advantage Nashville has over a lot of people is the, there's, there's, Anybody that ever gets signed by a Nashville artist here in Nashville, it's the one guy. He does all the training, whether it's Taylor Swift or whether it was Alan Jackson. They went through this course of how to hold a mic, how to use a mic. So most of the time that wasn't a problem. But if you, you know, people that grab mics at the very bottom, which means their hand is, is, is blocking the wireless signal. Okay. I'm totally with you. If there's an option for a wired mic, I'm going with a wired mic because I mean, I, I had hair before wireless. Okay. It's kind of my joke. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. So so let's uh let's so tell me about the just quickly the Earthworks mics that you use for the piano. Are those pencil condensers is it something that fits underneath the lid of the grand piano how does what what is that i haven't seen that before okay can if you can pull up their website you can see it but it's a bar that goes across the where the piano where the just above the strings on the grand piano it's a bar that goes across there and there's two mics that come off that bar and into a box and and there's some magic i, I call it the magic box but because it just sounds amazing um, and it's the best piano mic I've ever seen. Okay, so with that, Jude, let's talk about your technique here. You're using. You, I have not. I, I haven't. I haven't mic'd a lot of instruments, so there's that <laughs> as a start. But tell us about. There are those piezo mics. Is that what those are? are those boundary mics. What it's a. Th- it's a pressure zone mic. Okay. It's a PZM pressure zone. So it it picks up off of the the pressure differential. So it's not a, your typical diaphragm that's going to vibrate uh, like would be on a dynamic. So when when you look at miking an instrument, you got to figure out how does it even create the sound. And so you think about those microphones are like the ears for our sound system. So we got to get that sound into the sound system and try to do it justice. And the the difficult thing with a grand piano or even an upright is that whole. Uh, wood cabinet is vibrating. The whole thing vibrates. The soundboard's this huge, uh, really thin piece of material that just vibrates like a speaker diaphragm. And so you got to figure out, how can I pick up all of these sounds with a microphone or with two microphones? And then you have 88 keys on your piano. And I believe the bottom note on the piano is like 27 hertz and the top one's 42, 4100, and so you got to try to figure out how do we how do we reproduce all those sounds. So I have gone off of uh, using PZMs on the lid of the piano. And Monica, if you take the iPad, uh, we got a little clip here. So while you're talking, I just pulled this up, and and uh, Kurt's not trying to push the videos I do on on my channel, but it, it's kind of hard to see. But there's two PZMs um, on that mic on that piano, so you can see. Um, there's a white, uh, let's see, can I, uh, let's see here. There's a white microphone uh, clip on one side, and then I was just touching the other um, the other PZM. And so we're using the lid of the piano as a big uh, diaphragm to help pick up all of those sounds. And so right below my hands are the strings, and then right below the strings is the soundboard. And so uh, there's one microphone um, and then they, there's another microphone that is just to the right of that. Okay, uh, why don't you come back, Monica? So uh, trying to pick up uh, the piano is uh, is a challenge. And then for us here at our church, we close the lid every service uh, because we have humidifiers on the pianos. They they are our primary instrument. And so after the service, the lids get closed, and there's a whole water reservoir underneath, and it's trying to keep the wood hydrated to keep the tune of the piano longer. And one of the things that I found when you take um, microphones and you boom them in, or, or Matt, what are you even talking about with your earthworks, if you can't close the lid and then uh, and, and leave the microphones without moving them, I'm not interested in it because once you get those microphones set, you don't ever want to touch them. So for us, keeping the pianos hydrated and conditioned throughout the week, that is really important. Uh, so anyways, on that video, I just talked about how that piano works, uh, how, how it generates the sound. And then uh, I just mentioned his name, Joe Miser, who uh, referenced the uh, this terrible Behringer C2. I'm Sorry about that, but anyways, uh, he's a piano player, and so he talks about it from a piano uh, player's perspective as well. You can close the lid all the way with the gotcha with the earthwork system. Yeah. What what what's the cost? Do you know on those earthwork mics? It's, Earthworks. Yeah, one dollar under three thousand. Two so, and then. So those uh, those PZMs, the 30Ds that I use, um, $494 a piece. Uh, so a, about a grand, about a grand. Um, for, for, for a pair. And it's it's really... You're going to put them face to face, right? Yes, yes. Yep. And then also uh, for our congregational singing, I mean, we, we can be hitting 90... 92 decibels with the singing in this room. It's a horse-shaped room, I'm so the sound is just right here. And so we also have those mic- microphones positioned to where they're going to pick up some of the brighter frequencies of the piano. Human- humans hear 
most efficiently between 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 hertz. That's what requires the least amount of electricity for us to hear the sound. And so we position those microphones as well so during that congregational singing, I can punch pitch and tempo through the clutter of the room, and that way everybody can hear where we're at. Uh, I, I found over the years, if I'm not driving the lead instrument for our congregational singing, then people aren't going to try to reach that volume. They'll always try to fall so they can hear their pitch and tempo. Do you you don't have drums rarely? No, no. Okay, the, drums are a whole nother problem for because a mm-hmm. lot of our church was more contemporary. We rarely had a choir when we. Had I'm, a, I'm a recovering drummer myself. Okay, so when you bring the, you bring in drums to the mix, it's, it becomes a. a on a stage it's you've got to keep the drum mics the drums from going everywhere now the the guy that cured that problem is the is, and i forgot to say, i know him i think it's rick um who was garth Brook, brooks's guy he built a totally glass cage the drummer actually went through a door and it was sealed up it was a, it was soundproofed best solution for drums but if you work for phil collins Drums are the primary thing, and so therefore, you can't even you put plexiglass up. So it, it becomes a huge challenge, and in, because in, a lot of places that aren't what I call doing strobes and, and fancier stuff still have drums occasionally in the worship service, and so the challenge is finding a drummer that knows how to play the room right. Okay, because some drummers are deaf and they just go at it. <laughs> so. But anyway, but if they know how to play the room right and they can play them in a lesser volume, that is ideal. And that's also teaching your instrumentalist how to contribute to the overall sound. And it's not just going to be, hey, I'm going to be the lead person when you're not. And so it's teaching people how to use their mics, where do you position them in the mix, and how can they contribute uh, to the overall success of what's trying to happen. Um, uh, I played the drums. I was a drum major in high school. My wife is rolling her eyes right now because there's no such thing, but that's what helped me get through high school, even though I didn't. Uh, but I played the drums. Uh, so uh, my home church, uh, I would play the drums there and I would use brushes. And so that is using brushes to soften the drum so I'm not overpowering the piano. So just giving a little bit of rhythm, a little bit of percussion feel with the piano. We have a, an interesting question here I wanted to bring up quickly here from Carl. Question, is using production mics in live sound situations a bad idea because production mics have better high end, causing feedback problems with live sound? Is that true? What would you describe a um, production microphone? It's a good I mean, question. Good like question. A Newman, the, the Newmans you would use in a studio are not particularly good live mics okay okay yeah that kind of stuff would be i would say yes but like the studio that i have walk-in rights to they have a whole set of 57s sure 57s are using on on guitar miking a, a guitar cabinet is an art form too um but they um they they use a 57 and another mic it's condenser for that wider pickup um but it's it's a again it's an art form you, you 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 find a Marshall stack that has whether it's two or four speakers in a guitar cabinet. They're not the same. So you pump pink noise through and find which one of you, you actually just use your headphones and record it and find which one is the best speaker and then you go from there. Uh, that's just things you learn in a studio that you would never you, you you do it a little bit in live, but it's not something you really worry about in the live situation. But in the studio, you have to worry about these. So, in the answer to the question, uh, production mics, uh, some yes, some no. So uh, for for us, uh, we're going to use microphones that have been tried and true. I mean, they're, they're going to work for us. Uh, there's a couple times where we'll take uh, Sure KSM 44s, and um, in one of the videos I've done, uh, Joe, that piano player, he was doing a mid-side mic, and we've used that for our broadcast mix. We're trying to pick up a a wider section of the orchestra where the broadcast side, they don't have to worry about all the, the 55 mics uh, for the broadcast. But what we try to do is stack the deck in favor for uh, more gain before feedback. And that's teaching people, well, I got four rights. The four rights of a sound tech, the right, right mic, the right EQ, the right volume at the right time. 
And so that's what I try to train sound techs is just those four simple rights. Uh, and so getting back to even some of these basic microphones, I a three hundred dollar microphone. I mean, there's there's nothing to write home about it, but it's it's going to do the job really well. Um, you want to stay away from mics that uh, obviously they look like they should be in a studio, or you're going to want to stay away from um, anything anything with the word Amazon Basics. <laughs> uh, that, that's not where you need to be shopping for pro audio. And and Matt was talking about this earlier too. Um, in in our auditorium, the speakers stay the same. The the piano and the organ they stay the same. The the sound system stays the same. But uh, when when I travel and do big events, like uh, in a couple of weeks we'll be in Branson. Uh, Curtis, I think I sent you pictures a year ago where we're in a in the in a room the size of a football field, and we have to cover that whole thing with sound. I'm mean, just this massive room, and there's going to be a whole new set of of challenges that I'm going to deal with. But these same microphones that I've talked about here, those are the same microphones I'm going to take with me when we're doing our um, our couples retreat in Branson uh, next month. Um, same thing with uh, people doing uh, post production at home. There's no standard, actually, there, there, there's not too many standards to follow from on audio outside of THX. So uh, 80s and 90s, I mean, we can remember the, the, the uh, THX bass drop or low note is what they call it. THX is Tom Holman crossover. And so that's where George Lucas was finding all the sounds that they were doing with Star Wars was getting lost in the movie theaters because there's no standard. And so Tom Holman, he came up with a series of speakers, crossover specifications to try to make things constant and uniform. So that would be the best standard that we have today would be, are your speakers uh, going to be a THX certified? And so if they are, you're going to have really deep, rich, low end tones. And then uh, where your, where your uh, vocal range comes through, uh, and then where your intellig intelligibility range comes through, uh, that's not going to get lost in the mix. I've thought about, for the fun of it, getting this system certified, THX certified. I think we would pass it, but, I mean, would we put it on the church bulletin and say, you're walking into a THX certified auditorium? I, I don't think our pastors would go for that. No, but some churches, they, <laughs> they probably have. Okay, I don't know. Curtis, I may have um, no, digressed no, no. a little bit. All good, all good. So, um, one one question we did have come in, Jude, is what? Tell us about the mixer that's behind you. This is uh, Alan and Heath's Queen of the Fleet. It's the D Live. It's the S seven thousand. So we've had this thing for seven years, and it is amazing. Um, I'm much much like Matt. I'm an analog guy. I was trained under the pioneers of the '60s, '70s, and '80s of sound. And so we, I had the unique privilege of learning how sound worked in an analog form. Um, it took me a long time to make the decision to go digital. Uh, our music director was pushing for it, but I kept fighting back. But then we had a lightning strike, uh, hit the building, burned out our uh, mixing console. And so that was the time, and especially for the next person that comes in after me, they're going to be more familiar with digital than analog. And so we wanted to make sure that we're going to be setting up the next generation for success. And it was time that I needed to learn um, uh, digital. Uh, so it's it's pretty amazing. When we, when we bought it, the uh, Surface, which is behind me, that thing was $20,000. The mix rack that sits uh, to my right, that's where all the preamps are, that is $7,000. So we can take the Surface out and we could run the whole thing with an iPad. But one of the reasons why I chose the D-Live was it gave me the most tactile feel of an analog console. Um, so it has the most faders, the most knobs, the, the biggest screens at the time. And so it gave me the ability to still run it like a analog sound system. So uh, in Allen and Heath, they got the D-Live, and then below that is Avantis, and then below that is going to be SQ, and then you got QU. Um, I've, I've stuck with uh, Allen and Heath for probably 20, a good 20 years now. I've just standardized with them. Uh, that way I know what the preamps are going to sound like. I know the routing. Um, I mean, I go into churches quite a bit where they got a Behringer um, X32, and it's something that I try to get them to pull out because it's not laid out in a lineal format, top to bottom, left to right. It's just there. And so with digital, you, you got to think about layers. You got to think about three-dimensional uh, length, width, and height. Where analog, it's top to bottom, 
and left to right. It's a lot harder to mess up analog. Uh, but then, uh, like Curtis for this stream uh, today, um, we just re we just recalled this scene that we did a year ago where we had all the routing through Dante and then the EQ on this uh, RCA microphone was still in there. And so it was, a, it was a breeze to get set up. So there's a lot of advantages to digital, um, but I still try to run it like an analog console. What does it mean to run it like an analog console? Just for those that are that have grown up in the digital age. Yeah, so a lot of people rely on presets, and I have one preset. It's it's number seven, and it's called Church. Every time I come in for a sound check, uh, that's what I hit. I just recall the Church preset, and that's our starting EQ. So we had a trio this morning, and then we had a solo. Uh, I hit that Church preset. It recalled everything to our starting EQ, and then I I re EQ'd each voice on the trio, and then I re-EQ'd the, um, the soloist. And then that way, I'm not just saying, hey, uh, this is our prelude, and I hit this button. This is our welcoming. I hit this button. This is a choir opener. I hit this button. Um, I, I still try to run it as if there's no presets, as if there's no uh, EQ library or shortcuts. Uh, so just still trying to be very involved in the mix. Um, a church in Tulsa years ago, uh, they would take um, every bullet point of their service and they'd make a preset for it. And so when they would get to, let's say, a choir song, it would mute the pulpit mic, unmute the choir mics. Well, the pastor would come up and want to interrupt, but all of a sudden his pulpit mic is muted because they uh, hit a preset. And they were looking down at their service. They weren't paying attention and anticipating. Um, on, on that trio this morning, uh, two of the singers, they switched the, the microphones uh, when they were walking up to sing. And so on the fly, I had to transfer EQ and then a fader position in the moment. And so that teaches me to be proficient. Where is everything on a digital console? Um, and then not just rely on, oh, this is what, this is what I do, and I'm a button pusher. Uh, I'm Pusher. I do have a question for him. I, I prefer analog, obviously. And the reason I do is you can go past zero. Digital zero is it. Uh huh. And, and an analog, you can push to plus three, plus six, plus 10 in some cases. Um, have you had that problem with your digital board? Not no. There? No, so on, on Allen and Heath, once you hit the peak light, you have another 18 decibels of gain before you hit digital distortion. It is unbelievable, unbelievable. So there's there's been one or two times in six or seven years that we've had this that uh, we've had distortion on the preamp from somebody overdriving it. Typically, a preacher that was really trying to hammer a point home. I want to uh, just quickly. Uh, you had mentioned earlier, Jude, and then we have another question, a really good question in the um, chat here that we'll come back to, but. You had you you played that little clip where there was something very odd going on with the violin as the you know you had the trios up there to sing. Can you tell us about that experience? What happened there? I want to, but I think our music director is watching the stream right now, and he was really bothered that I was going to show that. Um, Monica, let, let's uh, let me try to find it. Okay, um, so we'll, we'll play it again. This happened um, two years ago, <laughs> two years ago, and it is now, this is the first time that it's ever seen the light of day. It um, was a trio, and we're supposed to have a violin uh, come in and play. So, uh, Monica, go ahead and take the uh, Mac. Titled Never Walk Alone. Yeah, this is about where, um, yeah. So right now we're trying to figure out where, where. I think Jude may, ne may need to make one adjustment up there, but let's start that again. Brother Kevin. Yeah, so that's the music director, and I don't know if he's watching right now. You can listen to the piano right there, so that's the two PZMs. And then you'll hear the Audio-Technica um, uh, AE3300 on, her, on uh, this lady's voice. Stretched open wide, barely hang. Okay. 
Monica, why don't you come back? Okay, so, uh, yeah, I can't tell you uh, exactly what happened. I wanted it to be a little teaser, but that, that was uh, probably in front of 13, 1,400 people. And it, it was on our uh, live stream broadcast as well, so it's part of our national record of the church. And that was the biggest mistake I have ever made. Yeah. And what, what was the mistake? Oh, man. You're trying to pull me out. You're trying to pull we're, it out. We're going to pull it out of you, Jude. We, I'll tell you one of Jude, mine. Jude, so. Jude this, is, this is you <laughs> helping your fellow soundies. This is, not, this is not like, oh, can you believe Jude did this? What, Monica? <laughs> Monica's in the broadcast room saying, just tell them. Are you buying tacos after this? Is that what's going on? Okay. So what happened was we, we mic'd the violins up, and she had a wireless body pack on. And we lock on the, on the battery pack. So here's our sure transmitter. We lock it on. That's one of the things that we do to try to minimize anybody coming in. In the stress of the moment, they forget to turn on their wireless mic. That's just we're trying to stack the deck for success. So she came down from the youth room, asked, asked an usher if, um, if we were on the first congregational song or the second congregational song. And the usher, uh, he said we're on the first, which in fact we were on the second congregational song. And then after that second song was this trio. So she grabbed her violin and she went uh, in a hallway somewhere and she started warming up and just practicing. Well, when, when um, the piano player started playing, I mean, I'm looking feverishly. Monica was sitting right next to me at the time. We're looking, it's like, what is going on? And where is she at? And then I look down at the console and I see the metering in a PFL format. So I can see there's something going on. I quickly put it in my headphones real quick. It's like, yeah, that's her. And then I'm like, what is going on? Is she sitting on the front row? Is this going to be a, like a Celtic woman? Is she going to come dancing in? And uh, what is going on? And so in the heat and the stress of the moment, I unmuted the microphone and she was warming up uh, next to our nursery area. And what happened was she lined up so perfectly. I mean, it sounded like she was actually playing, but then you just heard what she was playing. She, uh, she was not lining up. And so it was just a stressful moment of like, what just happened? And then the music director gets up. He's he's baffled because I we we strive real hard for for um, the right volume at the right time. I mean, I strive so hard for that, not to miss any mic cues. And so I didn't want to miss a mic cue. And so I went with a microphone. I could not see. I just could I could see the metering, but I didn't know where she was. And uh, I tell you what, the uh, the Holy Spirit left the building. Uh, I mean, the 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 Bible's clear about you can't lose your salvation, but I think I was awfully close. Uh, I think you're redeeming yourself right now by informing all of you us. Confess, so that yeah, we you can, made your confession. You made your confession. You you helped your fellow human beings, the Soundies. So thank you for that. We we do have a really good question <laughs> that also came in from Daniela. Um, can you show the broadcasting choir and talk about the microphone positioning? Uh, yeah, let's see how we can do this here. Um. Monica, why don't you pull up the um, Mac again, please? Beyond four of the audio. Oh, come on. I'm sorry. Okay. Him. Having okay, so this this is on that video I made, and you can see in this next shot we've got four choir mics. Four of the Audio Technica Artist Elite 5100s. Stand here. Stand here. Okay, Monica, come back. Uh, so those we, we use four microphones for our choir, uh, one for each section, soprano, alto, tenor, bass. When you distant mic anything, uh, your, your gain before feedback goes down. So the more mics you have open, the more the greater chance of feedback you're going to have. When I first started doing sound here, we had eight microphones. Uh, they were double stacked, and we could not get as much headroom as possible, so we dropped out four of the microphones. And then we also use a bigger element. Um, a lot of choir mics, they're going to be a kind of a sub-miniature element. They're not going to sound as natural as a bigger element. This is still not as big as like a one-inch diaphragm. But we hang these uh, eight foot off the ground, and we use the polar pattern to help mix. So people that are closer to the microphone, they're going to be standing under it, which they're going to be more off axis, axis 
Uh, so this is a thir- uh, 130 degree polar pattern, I believe. It's a, it's a cardioid microphone. So as we get closer to the microphone, you're more under it, you're off axis, so it, you're not going to pick up as loud. And then we also try to move people around, like if, if they have a voice that really cuts through uh, just some nasal or harsh tones, we try not to put them right in the center on axis. So uh, that's what we use. It's the um, Artist Elite 5100, four, four of them. Did uh, Daniela, did that answer your question? I've used those mics before as well. We always angled them probably 20, 25 degrees down. So uh, she, she's asking why is the position is so much deep. Uh, Curtis, is she talking about the like the angle? I think, I of think this? yeah. I think you just addressed that actually. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So we're 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 using four mics trying to pick up. On average, we have a hundred people in the choir. That was our college choir that you saw as well. So it, it doubles. And so we're, we're trying to mix them around the microphone and we're trying to use the microphone placement as our uh, mixer as well. So proper proper uh, placement as well. People will say, hey, I want an omnidirectional mic because I need to pick up the choir. That's gonna be disaster just waiting to happen. I'm not sure I 100% understand this, but Danielle also <clears throat> asks, why not using support microphones? Well, those, those might be on stands that, that like boom stands. Uh, so, uh, Danielle, if that's your question, uh, we don't do that because I don't want those stands to move. Uh, again, same thing when we get back to the pianos as well. Once we find those sweet spots for the microphones, we want to keep them in the same spot. Uh, so a stand can uh, allow you to clear your stage or platform real easy and have a clean look. But ours uh, our choirs uh, such an important part of our church service. So we use the choir mics multiple times multiple, multiple times every week. So we don't have to reset them, rebalance yeah. them, angle them. Yeah, most people that have a choir loft will have the mics. Hanging. In our case, we will, would bring out mic uh, choir risers, and so we would use stands because otherwise, we the only time we used them, and so we would have to use stands. Uh, but generally, if you have a choir loft and you're using choir mics on a regular basis, like the church I go to as well, now it's it's they're they're prepositions. Uh-huh. Good, good. Let's um, let's take a. We only have a few minutes, but I want Matt. You brought up a little something earlier that I want to explore a little bit more. Can you give us just a very? <laughs> this may sound ridiculous. You've mic'd drums before. Tell us about that. Um, yeah, drum drum miking is again. Generally speaking, always buy start with a kit. I don't care whether it's AKG's kit, Shure's kit. Earthworks kit, use a kit to begin with. Uh, generally, you need two overhangs, okay, pointed, um, depending on what you're using. There's different ways to point them for the different mics you're using. Uh, start with a kit and then add on to that kit. Um, now, some people get crazy. Uh, Garth Brooks's drummer is one of those. Every mic, every drum was double drum, double mic. You had one on top and one below. And, and, and uh, in studio, you can do that, but I, in live, uh, at least with the Earthworks kit that that I'm happy with, you, you, it's that little. It's a little bitty mic. It it performs great. It's condenser driven, but it's it's a it's not what you normally can. The trouble with gym, some condenser mics are just pick up everything that they don't. Uh, but anyway, the 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 it's a again. You've got to you've got to put a mic on everything. I mean, that I've done orchestras and I've done church orchestra. I do them the same way. Okay. You put a mic, not necessarily, pretty much, I prefer to put a mic on everybody because not everybody is Zigzag Perlin. Okay. <laughs> not everybody is Van Clyburn. I mean, we had a case where we had five piano players once. They should have had four. And I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> and so if you look at my fader knobs, they were here, 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 and here because I care about what's coming out. Yep, 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 makes sense. Does makes that, sense. I mean, I can go further into drums. No, so. that's that's yeah. good, I know we have. There's a huge, I mean, there's fights going on between some sound engineers. You put the drum, the bass drum inside on a pillow, whether you put it at at the opening or, or back of an inch or two. Yeah, so, I mean, you can, but in a studio, you play with those things. You, you actually have a drummer drumming and you're in there yeah. inside and, you, and you're pulling it and you find the sweet spot for that drummer, and then you lock yeah. it down. 
it's that drum it's that room it's it's the drummer it's it's all one thing we haven't said and i'm not affiliated with these people anymore at all but a mic stand is not a mic stand. When 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 Jude said you don't buy something from Amazon that has Amazon's name on it, that's true, especially for mic stands. A a, a really good mic stand, and we were lucky again. We had um, triads, or it's uh, the they they cost four times what everybody else's mic stands. But you there are differences between a good mic stand and a bad mic stand, and that you know. <laughs> I was at a church where they had a bad mic stand and the soloist did not want to hold their mic. They wanted it space. And, and the thing just started doing this. Yep. First, yep. first she's bending her knees and then she's. <laughs> so, yeah. It's happened to us too. So, <clears throat> so Jude, what do you do for mic stands there? Uh, we use ultimate and Atlas. Um, okay. So Atlas MS 12 B uh, Atlas MS 20, uh, those, those are just simple mic stands. Uh, I prefer just the big heavy bass. So the MS-12 is your typical size. The MS-20 is a bigger, uh, heavier bass. So you can go up higher. You can boom out further. Um, that's what we use, Atlas or um, or uh, Ultimate. Okay, good, good. But it, it's like, as I said, if you use a triad orbit, it's hard to go back. <laughs> they, they, are, they are beautiful. They are, but they, you're right. They're, I, I think they're more than four times, actually. I mean, like if you compare to the... Oh, what yeah. are the the thirty dollar uh, on stage stage oh, yeah. versus the? Jude, uh, I have a question. Do you use do you use clips? Do you use speed clips on your mic so you can change them out? Or you like the L O two B E's? Yeah, like yeah, Atlas had them. They're called L O twos. That's the part number. Uh, no, we don't. No, no, we use the uh, like the five eighths thirty threads. I think is what they are. No, I'm talking the quick release systems. Oh no, nope. See. The, we, I was in a church similar to your side, a little bit bigger than yours, but we had to always change out these mics. And then somebody brought, somebody just brought in these quick release. That, that changed my world because I saved mm -hmm. 30 minutes in setup by the quick releasing versus having to spin off the, the mic uh, yeah. holder and then spin them back on versus having, you know, click, click, and you're done. You don't get carpal tunnel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Curtis, can I, can I throw uh, one uh, thought? I'm, I'm sure Danny's calling you for lunch. She is. Um, tacos are tacos are ready. <laughs> tacos ahead, are you. upstairs. Hurry up! Uh, it was a couple of weeks ago, and I don't know if it's Linda or uh, Shoji that uh, asked a question about how do you find a mentor uh, with audio. I don't know if you remember that question, and I've just been thinking about it. Um, and I've had mentors in my life, and and these are the people that have have been important to me. They've had this this characteristic. They received knowledge. They learned knowledge, and then they gave knowledge. And so one of the reasons why I enjoy um, uh, watching your, uh, um, uh, what is this called? It's not a podcast. I think <laughs> live stream is because you've learned, you've received, and then you're giving as well. And you're doing it in a great way. And so for whoever asked that question, just trying to find a mentor, um, for me, it's like if, if I like somebody's sound, I want to dive into it and figure out, how are they doing that? What equipment are they using? And then as I dive in deeper, is it somebody that I can align with or somebody that's going to take me a direction I don't want to go? Um, Dave Ratz, uh, he has a lot of knowledge and, and there's a lot of stuff I've learned from him, but he's, he's not a guy that I'm going to walk side by side. And so, uh, I mean, he's, he's not a mentor, but he's, he's, um, he has that information. So whoever asked that question, uh, it's, it's just, it's this, it's part of the circle of, uh, there is knowledge before you. You received knowledge, you learned knowledge, and if you can find somebody that's willing to take that knowledge learned and give it to the next generation, that's what's important about trying to find a mentor. And that's one of the reasons, Curtis, why I enjoy listening to you is because of, of how you handle that. Um, I enjoy talking with Alan. I'm, I checked in with him yesterday, I, um, and and he's the same way. He That guy can talk and he has a lot of information and he likes to help the next generation and he even, also even though like a very good cable by the way and and even though we're not in the same trade um <laughs> thanks thanks alan uh even though we're not in the same trade uh there's a lot of things that i've been learning and it's like man i wish i could do that in live but i can't so whoever asked that question when you're trying to find a mentor that's what i look forward uh, look for in a mentor that's uh, I completely agree. That's absolutely great advice. And indeed, 
Uh, we are running into cold tacos, so we're going to go ahead and <laughs> call it now. Um, but first of all, let's go around really quick. Matt, if people want to learn more from you, where should they go? I don't have anything really. I mean, I have, okay. a, I have a YouTube channel, but I don't do much on it yet. You're retired. We're going to bring you back on again. We're going to learn more from you. And then Jude, where should people go to learn more from you? I got a YouTube channel. I mean, it's not big. It's it's meant to try to help people in, in my trade and, and, and especially like with the churches that we do installs with, just trying to give them continu continuing education. But it's so hard to make a video that's of a high quality when you're trying to uh, live a life, have a family. Um, we have goats. I mean, that takes a lot of time. And then also trying to make a good quality video. So it's audio buff on YouTube. Excellent. Thank the, you both. The challenge is, can I butt in and say, I, I would love to make them, but I've seen the production quality of Curtis Judd and I I don't I can't get there yet. So I, I'm I know you don't like it, but it's true. I mean, you 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 produce a I try I tried producing, you know, these videos professionally once and it's a lot of work and you of course gotten you've done it a lot and you've gotten used to it. But you your qual find people there's a guy that maybe her name Tom Buck who has a channel he's very he's he came from the teaching world he knows how to teach and some people don't okay this is not their gift so it, it's not as easy said than done so i appreciate that thank you thank you both so much for coming on today and sharing your knowledge and your experience um hopefully we can do this again uh another time in the meantime uh we will talk to you all again soon thanks everybody take care and I, now I got to figure out how to do this outro part. Uh, do you want me to sing? I can sing no, if you want. No, 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 no. Well, <laughs> I think that was just Monica saying no. <laughs> yes, that was. Okay. All right. Well, take care, everybody. Talk to you soon.